U svakom slučaju hvala vam što ste došli u ovom broju, malo vas je iznenadio veliki interes, računat ćemo s tim u narednim prilikama. Dakle, ja ću sad preći na engleski, večerašnje predavanje će isto biti na engleskom, naš gost će govoriti na 40-ak minuta, nakon toga će Tomislav Tomašević dati neku refleksiju na predavanje i pokušati napraviti neke poveznice sa situacijom ovdje i nakon toga ćemo imati vremena za pitanja. So, I would like to welcome Nick Theodore. And this is the first lecture in the series of lectures organized together by Grupa 22, Group 22, is that the English name? Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, Mama. Um, and uh, when we conceptualized this series of talks, uh, we wanted to re reflect uh, on the city as a strategic arena uh, for contestation. Um, cities uh, have been arena for or sites of contestation um, throughout long uh, history of capitalism uh, for worker uh, struggles, um, urban movements, um, and other forms of contestation. Uh, it, ha it comes naturally because uh, since recently more than 50% of global population lives in the cities. But at the more structural level, we could think of the history of contemporary city as being coextensive with the history of uh, capitalism. In a way, cities, contemporary cities were structured uh, by the capitalist um, mode of production and uh, they themselves in many ways reproduce uh, the capitalist system. So cities being the strategic site uh, and being structured by uh, the capitalist process uh, conditions um, the options and the possibilities and um, in a way reach of uh, the struggles taking place uh, in, in, in this arena. And if uh, not adequately theorized and, and understood how uh, this site is conditioned by capitalism as its uh, conditioning uh, process, uh, we risk failure uh, in the long run uh, with uh, various anti-systemic struggles. So um, in this series we want to reflect what are the systemic conditions that are put on the cities and uh, how to understand uh, these conditions in order to uh, reflect uh, what we can do and how we can act. Um, and uh, so our guest tonight, Nick Theodore, uh, has been concerned uh, together with his um, um, thinking com compadres or, or, or fellows um, Jamie Pack and Neil Brenner uh, with conceptualizing uh, the theory of uh, neoliberalism. And um, they start from a concept of uh, neoliberalism which is not unitary concept. It's not uh, one form of uh, governance, um, restructuring of society uh, to the demands of uh, free markets and capitalism, but they can see, uh, they understand it and understand it as um, historically uh, and geographically diversified process that produces different conditions across uh, the globe. And these different conditions then in turn um, increase the competition between different localities uh, in the global arena. Um, so uh, this is the kind of theory that in a way uh, we think reflects uh, on the possibilities of action uh, within the city as a strategic uh, site of action. So um, to introduce our guest tonight, um, 
Uh, Nick Theodore is Professor of Urban Planning and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also a Senior Associate at the Great Cities Institute, Associate Dean of, for Faculty Affairs and Research in the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, and editor of Antipode, a radical journal of geogra geography. He has held posts um, as vis visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg and uh, York University. And he is a senior research fellow at the University of Manchester, or was. Yeah, still am. You still, yeah. okay. Uh, he is co editor together with Neil Brenner of Spaces of Neoliberalism, Urban Restructuring in North America and Western Europe, and co author with Neil Brenner and Jamie Peck of Afterlives of Neoliberalism. Um, I should say that. This uh, short booklet, Afterlives of Neoliberalism, was translated uh, the other day by Right to the City and is um, available in Croatian uh, as, as well at the website of uh, Right to the City. And finally, um, before I give uh, the word to, to our speaker, I should also say that uh, this lecture and the series is co-organized by Heinrich Bo, uh Foundation Croatia. So, uh, Nick, please okay. take the floor. Well, let me start with a, a word of thanks. And first, thanks to all of you for coming out on, on a cold winter night. I uh, really appreciate it. And also thanks to my hosts. It's, it's really fantastic to be here with you. Uh, it's been great to listen to some of the recent developments here in Zagreb and some of the challenges you face. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation after, uh, after the talk. So I'm here, here tonight to talk a little bit about the puzzling life and death of neoliberalism and how cities fit into that, that whole story. Uh, in, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, commentators from across the political spectrum rush forward to proclaim the death of neoliberalism. Uh, in late 2008, at the onset of the financial crisis, French President Nicolas Sarkozy, for instance, tried to calm an in increasingly anxious public by saying, a certain idea of globalization is dying with an end of a financial capitalism that had I imposed its logic on the whole of the economy and contributed to perverting it. Self-regulation to fix all problems is over. Laissez-faire is over. A few months before that, social scientist Emmanuel Wallerstein was arguing that the political balance is swinging back. Neoliberal globalization, he said, will be written about 10 years from now as a cyclical swing in the history of the capitalist world economy. And then there was Naomi Klein speaking at an event at the University of Chicago opposing the founding of a multi-million dollar research institute uh, named for neoliberal economist Milton Friedman. And she suggested that with the financial crisis, neoliberalism may have encountered its Berlin Wall moment, an indictment of an ideology. And finally, there was former Austrian federal chancellor Alfred Gusen, uh, Gusenberg, Gusenbauer writing from Vienna, one of the symbolic birthplaces of neoliberalism, arguing that the crisis is to neoliberalism what the fall of the Berlin Wall was to authoritarian communism. This was an amazing turn of events for a political project and an ideology that critic Perry Anderson once labeled the most successful in world history. But of course, this wasn't the end of the story, was it? I suppose one, could be, one can't be blamed for thinking that the, that the mounting evidence of policy failure, of, dis, of the destructive and social and ecological externalities associated with neoliberalism, of the endemic inequalities that it's generated, and, that the, and the exploding <laughs> uneven spatial development, that all of these, all these crises, the financial crises and everything, all the crises, large and small, would by now have led to the undoing of this singularly contradictory regulatory paradigm. But apparently not, at least not yet. The 2008 financial crisis may have revealed for all to see the failings of this mode of governance, but its after aftermath revealed a failing on the left to capitalize on the moment of crisis to expose the intrinsic flaws in the neoliberal operating system that has been driving contemporary capitalism and to offer a vision that galvanizes popular support for radical alternatives. As, uh, as economist Milton Friedman famously 
once said, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When a crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, he said, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to, keep, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. One of the hard questions that the left must ask itself um, is how, how it's going to develop ex uh, alternative policies, um, alternatives to the existing policies, and to keep them alive long enough that they can move from the politically impossible to the polit politically inevitable. As Tom was saying, on and off for the past 15 years, I've been working with two North America-based um, professors, Jamie Peck and Neil Brenner. And we've been trying to understand the contours of the neoliberal project, as well as the central role that cities play in the production of neoliberal policy experiments, and in the, and in the struggle against processes of neoliberal Neoliberal, neoliberalization that are regressively remaking everyday life. And we, like you, have been trying to understand and make sense of the current moment. We're trying to understand what the post-financial crisis uh, realignment of forces means for urban politics as we search for a way forward from the difficulties that we're facing today. And we're trying to understand what it might mean for cities to advance toward a truly post-neoliberal period a period in which the free market theology has been discredited, a period in which market fundamentalism has been repudiated for the destructive and falsely utopian vision that it is. The, but the three of us are professors. Our, our primary objective has, has been to think critically about the nature of the problem and to try to formulate an analysis of actually existing neoliberalism. We're less helpful, I must confess, when it comes to questions of what to do next. But our hope is in that thinking through the nature of the problem and, and thinking through an analysis in dialogue with social movement organizations and activists and others, that together we might be able to alter the destructive path that we're on. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to share some aspects of the analysis that Neil, Jamie, and I have been doing over the past few years. And let, let's start with this Berlin Wall metaphor, a metaphor that was so popular in the days following the bursting of the financial bubble, especially on the left, where people were eager, eager to claim that neoliberalism had finally collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions. We didn't buy that argument then, and we're certainly not buying that argument now. I'd like to mention two reasons laid out by Jamie Peck in an article that we wrote at the time. I think they, these reasons point to an um, these reasons are important points for critical analysts who are trying to decipher the changing nature of urban politics in the post-2008 period. Uh, and, and so that we, we, we on the left resist a false sense of comfort that perhaps neoliberalism could, as I said, collapse once and for all under the weight of its own contradictions, thereby freeing us to direct our critical energies elsewhere. So our first caution concerns the form and character of neoliberalism itself. It goes without saying that to speak of neoliberalism in crisis presupposes an understanding of the character of this dispersed yet deeply embedded form of social rule. A singular monolithic, monolithic and unified neoliberalism might indeed be prone to a tor correspondingly total crisis. But as, as we've argued and Tom mentioned, a dynamic conceptualization of neoliberalization is what is to be favored over static notions of neoliberalism. By neoliberalization, we mean uh, a prevailing pattern of market or disciplinary regulatory restructuring. Neoliberal, neoliberalization is driven by a set of open-ended social processes uh, and because these projects, neoliberalization projects, collide in place with inherited political institutional arrangements, neoliberalism is, is associated with polymorphic forms and outcomes. In other words, the forms and outcomes of neoliberalization processes and projects differ from place to place because the institutional arrangements that they confront and remake differ from place to place. I'll add that this is one of the reasons that, that a key feature of neoliberalization is the exacerbation of geographical uneven development. 
This process contributes to uneven development within and between cities, within and between regions, and within and between countries. It follows that crises and contradictions will often impact particular social spaces or particular institutional arrangements and particular local formations rather than necessarily reverberate through the entire complex as a whole. So the impacts of neoliberalization may not be felt everywhere at once. Furthermore, neoliberalism's proven capacities in the downward and outward displacement and forward rescheduling of risks and crisis tendencies means that its regulatory landscapes are especially dynamic. Because neoliberalism does not exist as a unified and static structure or as an end state condition, it's less likely to fail in a totalizing moment of collapse. Because it isn't a unified structure, um, it, it, it cannot collapse in the, in, in the same way that the Berlin Wall metaphor suggests. So in this, this suggests, uh, in this sense, the historical analogy between the institutionally centralized and monological regime of state socialism seems particularly inappropriate. Turning to our second reservation about the Berlin Wall metaphor, one clearly needs to consider the relationship between the social formation in crisis, neoliberalism, and those actually existing alternatives positioned, as it were, on the other side of the wall. On the occasion of the collapse of state socialism, of course, the dominant presence on the other side of the wall was hardly benign. It was an aggressively expansive strain of free market capitalism, disproportionately shaped by the Anglo-American model. I hardly need to tell you that within months, countries of the former Soviet bloc were overrun uh, not only by a new breed of post-socialist entrepreneur, but also by armies of policy advisors, macroeconomic engineers, management consultants, and shock, therap and shock therapists all working in conjunction with newly empowered elites to push this transition to capitalism. This fatal rupture within, pre, within the pre-existing social order effectively created an ideological vacuum. But the way in which this vacuum was filled was shaped by the balance of geopolitical power in the external, so-called external capitalist world, by the strategic promotion of favored institutional and ideological designs, particularly those carrying the stamp of multilateral banks, powerful donor nations, and their various policy networks. The transition politics of the early 1990s conformed to a partially self-fulfilling vision of a free market society, setting its sights on a utopian endpoint, unattainable to be sure, but at the same time socially galvanizing. The marked contracts with the, with the current time uh, are immediately apparent. Neoliberal fundamentalism has certainly been challenged, while political elites have become gripped with new uncertainties. But far from driving towards some utopian endpoint, such as the, the self-regulating market economy, the crisis managers of today conspicuously lack any kind of destination imaginary or narrative beyond loosely formed notions of restoring growth at any cost. True, there's a, visceral, there's a visceral sense of the socio-spatial origin of the crisis, which was the failure of the US credit markets and their geographical <laughs> representation in the form of Wall Street. But there's a dissensus bordering on paralysis around the question of destination or even the direction of reform efforts. And the, the crisis managers effectively seem to be flying blind, and occasionally they'll confess as much. There's certainly little evidence today of the kind of transition imaginaries that were such a powerful force in the, in the period of post-socialist reconstruction. The dominant objective of crisis management efforts at the present time would seem to be first, the stabilization of credit markets as a means second of restoring orderly capital accumulation and economic growth. Ironically, we're told that the complexity of this task is such that it can only safely be handled by the very same elite um, of financial technocrats and bandits that brought us the crisis in the first place. But how much of a break from neoliberal practices does this really entail? Public debate, in public debates, there's a hazy understanding that the way out of the crisis will involve more regulation and perhaps a more active state. But there, 
but there are still a few clearly articulated visions of the alternative form that such compromises should take. None of the proposals we've seen over the last few years, of course, necessarily take us beyond neoliberalism, which was nothing if not a politics of growth, and which never totally rejected all forms of state intervention. Mainstream uh, assessments effectively imply that all that's required to borrow a stock market metaphor is a correction, a correction in financial regulation in order to bring repairs to the regime of financialized capitalism. And finally, let's, let's remember, for an ideology to be hegemonic, it's not necessary that it be loved. It's only necessary that it have no serious rival. About a decade ago, uh, Neil Brenner and I began working on the question of neoliberal restructuring under, or uh, began uh, working on the question of urban restructuring under neoliberalism. And we observed at the time that one of the key developments in this era of globalization is that local spaces are now increasingly being viewed as key arenas for a wide range of policy experiments and political projects. In the United States, I'm referring to the demolition of social housing, experiments that we have with privatization of public schools and infrastructure and other functions, the removing of the social safety net, and so on. Paradoxically, much of the appeal to the local actually rests on arguments regarding the allegedly uh, uncontrollable super-local transformations that are occurring, such as the financialization of, cap of capital, the erosion of the national state, and the intensification of interlocality competition. In Chicago, where I'm from, it seems that, that almost every local policy problem is now framed in terms of our relative position uh, in, the, in, in the global economy. This has been an incredibly powerful trope. But in, in the absence of a sustainable relative, re regulatory fix at the global or national scale, localities increasingly are being viewed as the only remaining institutional arenas in which we can reignite economic growth. And a wide range of policy experiments have been advocated in order to unleash the supposedly latent innovative capacities of local economies, to foster a local entrepreneurial culture, and to enhance labor market flexibility, local competitiveness, and place-specific place locational assets. Crucially for us, this new localism and its associated politics of place contain a number of deep ambiguities. Does the local really serve as a site of empowerment in the new global age? Or do discourses of globalization and localization just conceal a harsher reality of deregulation, regulatory downgrading, and intensifying interspatial competition? Have cities really acquired new institutional capacities to, to shape their own developmental pathways? Or are their fates being determined, or at least significantly constrained, by political economic forces that lie beyond their control? Are local regulatory experiments actually improving social conditions? Or are they rendering local economies still more vulnerable to global financial fluctuations, state retrenchment, and the capricious investment in decisions of transnational corporations? These ambiguities lie at the heart of new forms of policy experimentation and place production that have been proliferating across the urban economies of Europe, North America, and elsewhere. And they present significant puzzles for analysts of urbanization under contemporary capitalism. They, they pose profound strategic dilemmas for activists, too, concerned with remaking places toward more progressive, democratic, and socially just ends. So in thinking about the political economic characteristics of neoliberalism, I'd like to turn to a set of propositions that Neil and I developed that I think c captures some of the complexity of this form of social rule. First, first proposition, neoliberalism is a process. Neoliberalism is not a fixed end state or condition. Rather, it represents a process of market-driven social and spatial transformation, a process, as I've said, of neoliberalization. Second, neoliberalism does not exist in a single pure form. Instead, it's always articulated through historically and geographically specific strategies of institutional transformation and ideological rearticulation. 
Third, neoliberalism hinges on the active mobilization of state power. Neoliberalism does not entail the simple rolling back of the state and the rolling forward of the market. Instead, it, it generates a complex reconstitution of state economy relations in which state institutions are actively mobilized to promote market-based regulatory arrangements. Fourth, neoliberalism does not lead to identical outcomes in each, out, in each context in which it's, it's imposed. Rather, space Place-specific neoliberal regulatory projects collide with inherited regulatory landscapes. Contextually specific pathways of institutional re reorganization crystallize and reflect the legacies of earlier modes of regulation and forms of contestation. Fifth, I've just got three more. Um, neoliberalism is contested. It's contested by diverse social forces that are concerned to preserve non-market or socialized forms of coordination that constrain unfettered capital accumulation. Sixth, yeah, <laughs> neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalization exacerbates regulatory failure. The imposition of neoliberalism has not established uh, a framework for stable economic development or for social cohesion. Rather, neoliberalization projects are deeply contradictory insofar as they tend to undermine many of the economic and institutional preconditions for economic revitalization. Therefore, instead of resolving the political economic crisis tendencies of contemporary capitalism, neoliberalism exacerbates them by, by engendering various forms of market failure, state failure, and governance failure. And seventh, and you'll be happy to hear finally, uh, the neoliberal project continues to evolve. The failures of neoliberalism have not triggered its abandonment as a project of radical institutional transformation and, or as a, a mode of social rule. To the contrary, the project has continued to reinvent itself politically, organizationally, and spatially in close conjunction with its pervasively dysfunctional social consequences. In this sense, the task of propelling neoliberalism for, in the task of, of propelling neoliberalism forward, nothing succeeds like failure, since failure has been a key impetus for further rounds of experimentation within neoliberal parameters. Cities today are embedded within a, high, with, within a highly uncertain economic environment, characterized by fiscal instability, speculative movements of financial capital, and, the rapidly and rapidly intensifying interlocality competition. In the context of this deepening global local disorder, most local governments have been constrained, somewhat independent of their political orientation or national context, they've been constrained to adjust to heightened levels of economic uncertainty, <coughs> by, and, and they've tended to engage in short-termist forms of competition, place marketing, and regulatory undercutting, um, and other strategies of the sort to, in an effort to try to lure in investment and jobs. And we see that the impacts of, of these processes mapped everywhere across the built environment and across our urban landscapes. Meanwhile, the, the retrenchment of nat national welfare states and the retrenchment of national intergovernmental systems of transfer in many parts of, of, of Europe, North America, and, and elsewhere, these, the retrenchment of these have imposed powerful new fiscal constraints on cities. Now, I've, I've learned that, that those pressures are not so intense in Croatia at the moment, but I will say in much of Europe and North America, and certainly in North America, um, the retrenchment of welfare states and the retrenchment of intergovernmental transfer have imposed incredible pressures um, uh, uh, on cities, leading to budgetary cuts during a time when social problems and conflicts are intensifying in close conjunction with rapid economic restructuring. It's harder and harder for cities to contend with the dislocations that are occurring because these transfers are not coming from elsewhere. At the same time, neoliberal programs have also become interiorized into urban policy regimes. Um, as newly formed alliances attempt to rejuvenate local economies through a shock treatment of deregulation, privatization, liberalization, and fiscal austerity. So let's, let's take a minute and, and get a little more concrete and look at, at, at more concretely how, neo, ne, how neoliberalization has been remaking cities. 
Um, okay. So what we, we've been playing with these notions over the years, uh, these two kind of related notions. As Jamie had written, uh, Jamie and Adam Tekel had written about roll out and roll back neoliberalism, the idea that that or that first the state would roll back certain um, uh, elements and before rolling forward a new program. At the same time, uh, and at this point, we. we uh, Neil Brenner and I and then Jamie and Adam Tekel were working, but we weren't telling each other what we were doing. We were trying to beat each other to the punch. Neil and I, uh, in some sort of mind meld with Jamie, we had a similar idea. This moment of destruction and this moment of creation. That within neoliberalization projects, within uh, the, the, neo the urbanization of neoliberalism, there are these two moments. One where where old forms are being destroyed and at the same moment new forms are being created. And what I'd like to do and I promise this will be less abstract than what I've been saying, I'd like to walk you through at least some of these more concrete manifestations of neoliberal urbanism. And, and we'll start with this recalibration of intergovernmental relations that I was just talking about. So that moment of, of destruction it, for us was the dismantling of earlier systems of central government support to municipal activities. In parts of Europe and in North America, we had transfers from the national government to localities that were in distress, to, munici to municipalities that were struggling with economic adjustment. Much of those transfers have been eliminated. Instead, we see the devolution of responsibilities to municipalities, in many ways responsibilities without resources. And we see the creation of new incentives and new incentive structures to reward local entrepreneurialism and to catalyze endogenous growth. In the area of the retrenchment of public finance, that moment of destruction was the imposition of fiscal austerity measures upon municipal governments. And that moment of creation was the creation of new re revenue collection districts and increased reliance on local revenues, user fees, and other instruments of private finance. We can come back to these later if we want. Um, in, in, the, in, in another dimension, the privatization of, of the local public sector and and of collective infrastructure. I've learned over the last day that I've been here that this certainly is an issue that you're contending with here in Croatia. So the destructive moment was the elimination of public monopolies for the, for the provision of municipal services like utilities, sanitation, and mass transit. And that moment of creation was the privatization of municipal services and the creation of new markets for service delivery and infrastructure maintenance. In terms of the restructuring of housing markets, we see the raising of public housing and other low rent accommodation, the elimination of rent controls and other project based construction subsidies, while on the other hand, what's being rolled out is the creation of new opportunities for speculative investment in central city real estate markets. I know you know what I'm talking about here in Zagreb, and the introduction of market rents in low rent niches of urban housing markets. In terms of reworking labor market regulation, the rollback or destructive moment was the dismantling of traditional publicly funded education skills, training, and apprenticeship programs for disadvantaged workers. This is a particularly U.S. phenomenon, I think, but something that's been occurring in the U.K. and elsewhere as well. The moment of creation is the creation of a new regulatory environment to encourage contingent employment, part-time work, uh, temporary work, and so on, as well as the expansion of informalized economies. In terms of the transformation of the built environment in urban form, the destructive moment is the destruction of working class neighborhoods to make way for speculative redevelopment, so-called regeneration and rejuvenation, as well as the retreat from community-oriented planning initiatives. We'll leave it to the experts. The moment of creation is the creation of privatized spaces of elite consumption and the construction of mega, uh, mega projects in an effort to try to in, uh, attract corporate investment. Still, I guess we do everything too long. Um, and still within, in the realm of the transformation of the built environment, this rolling forward moment is the rolling forward of the frontier of gentrification, as well as the adherence to the planning principle of highest and best use as the basis for major land use planning decisions. I don't know how many of these to put in here. Okay, we had a lot of them, uh, but I know I didn't put them all in. You'll be relieved to hear. Anyway. 
I think there might be two more. In the re-regulation of urban civil society, the destructive moment was the, destructive, the destruction of the liberal city in which all inhabitants were entitled to basic civil liberties, social services, and political rights, while that moment of creation was new forms of surveillance and social control. The introduction of policies to combat so-called social exclusion by reinserting individuals into the low-wage labor market. And finally, in terms of representing, re-representing the city, there are these performative discourses of, of urban disorder, of dangerous classes, and of economic decline. And what they've been filled with in, in their place are entrepreneurial discourses and representations focused on urban revitalization, reinvent, uh, reinvestment, and rejuvenation. Let me just make sure, yeah, finally. Okay, <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to present those as a little more concrete um, examples of, of, of what forms and in, in, in the varied forms in which neoliberal neo, neo urbanization is occurring. Now, not all those are going to apply to Zagreb or to every city, but these are general tendencies I think that we've developed, that we've assessed in, in many parts of, of North America and Europe. Um, but we have to remember that, that, that in this context, in the context I've, I've been trying to describe, cities have become in, incredibly important and increasingly important geographical targets uh, and institutional laboratories for a variety of neoliberal policy experiments, from place marketing, enterprise zones, local tax abatements, public-private partnerships, and new forms of local boosterism to workfare policies, property redevelopment schemes, business incubator projects, new strategies of social control, policing and surveillance, and a host of other institutional modifications within the local state apparatus. <coughs> These kinds of experiments have been occurring with particular force within cities. And the overarching goal of these neoliberal policy experiments has been to mobilize city space as an arena both for market-oriented economic growth and for elite consumption practices. So we've argued that, that the creative destruction of, of institutional space at the urban at the urban scale does not entail a linear transition uh, from a generic model of a welfare city to the, the to a, toward a new model of the neoliberal city. Rather, these processes of local institutional change um, involve a contested trial and error searching process as experiments in local policy making are carried out within neoliberal parameters. However, even in the contemporary rollout phase, as, as Jamie and, and, uh, and Adam Tekel talked about it, uh, neoliberal strategies of localization severely exacerbate many of the regulatory problems they aspire to resolve, such as concentrated unemployment, socio-spatial polarization, and uneven development. Right? They exacerbate those very problems, leading in turn to unpredictable mutations uh, to those very strategies and the institutional spaces in which they're deployed. As a result, very form, uh, various forms and pathways of neoliberal localization should be viewed not as a coherent, sustainable solutions to the regulatory problems of late capitalism, but rather as deeply contradictory restructuring strategies that are significantly destabilizing inherited landscapes of urban governance. Cities have become increasingly central to the reproduction and continual reconstitution of neoliberalism during the last two decades. And indeed, as I've mentioned, we've argued that there's been a marked urbanization of neoliberalism uh, that has been occurring during this period as cities have become strategic sites for an increasingly broad range of neoliberal policy experiments. Under these conditions, cities have become the incubators for many of the political and ideological projects through which the dominance of neoliberalism has been maintained. Cities are key. In the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, an unstable consensus formed among the crisis managers of the leading economies and their advisors around the, the need to restart growth, to reflate slumping economies, and to restore faith in, in credit markets. Is this really the dawning of a post-neoliberal era in which the tyranny of market rule is vanquished through the rediscovery of multilateral cooperation and supranational regulation. It might be tempting to conclude that neoliberalism's end will, will come in the form of its own short, sharp shock of overdetermined financial crisis. 
and what awaits um, following its demise is a more humane post-neoliberal political order governed by fundamentally different priorities and interests. Look, there's little question that the financial crisis played cons placed considerable pressure on the neoliberal operating system worldwide. At the same time, the system has brought about a globally integrated, heavily privatized, trade exposed, deeply financialized, and socially polarized capitalism that is profoundly entrenched and interwoven into societal institutions. So given this, what's the scope for alternative politics? Neoliberalism, we've argued, is a project that's continually being made and remade. It didn't spring into life fully formed, the inevitable outgrowth of globalization or off the pages of, of Hayek's books. It's a work in progress and it's a site of struggle. David Harvey was quite right when he referred to neoliberalism as a utopia of process rather than as a utopia of spatial form. But what happens when this utopia of process touches down as it must in the material world of the city? As David Harvey says, capitalism cannot do without its spatial fixes, which is why it builds and rebuilds a geography in its own image. It constructs a distinctive geographical landscape that facilitates capital accumulation during one phase of its history, only to have it torn down and reconfigured to make way for further, for further accumulation at a later stage. The more that, that that free market utopianism converges on the inequities and unfreedoms of actually existing capitalism, David Harvey says, the harder they become to change, dislodge, and supersede. Neil, Jamie, and I have argued that cities are sites of experimentation. They're the command centers of neoliberalism, the places where policy ideas come from and where they're tested. But that they're also the places where the contradictions are most apparent, where the, where the destructive tendencies are most visible and where the everyday violence of neoliberalism is played out most vividly. In the US, we see this in, in many socio-political realms, in social housing, in welfare and workfare programs, in the privatization of education, in, in placing public spaces under private control, in running the city like a business, and in the logic of TINA, there is no alternative, TINA, right? There is no alternative to slashing spending, to, to, cutting, to cutting support, to eliminating programs, to bulldozing neighborhoods. Neoliberalism is also a political project that's being pursued by powerful interests. And the power of neoliberalism is woven into the sources of power within our cities. What does it mean to say that, that neoliberalism is woven into other sources of power and that it's still hegemonic? Does it mean that the dominant ideological par paradigm reigns uncontested, suffocating all alternatives? Well, Stuart Hall, for one, would say not. While he recognizes that neoliberalism has achieved and retains hegemonic status, Hall is equally insistent that no project achieves a position of permanent hegemony. It's a process, not a state of being. No victories are final. Hegemony is, is constantly to be worked on, maintained, renewed, and revised. Excluded social forces who cons whose consent has not been won, whose interests have not been taken into account, form the basis of counter-movements, resistance, alternative strategies and visions, and the struggle of a hegemonic system starts anew. But because neoliberalism has become in, intertwined with other sources of power, it's not like Goliath, where one well-placed shot to the head is going to take it down. It's going to require struggle, it's going to require analysis, and it's going to require struggle and analysis to be united to try to understand this thing called neoliberalism. But I also think it, it, it requires a different set of politics on the, uh, from what we often see today on the left. Cumulative causation um, in a polarized and fragmented metropolis produces increase, increasing territorial differentiations in wealth and power, rather than some sort of leveling process that brings greater equality. Just as this has placed, um, so, and, and this has placed increased need for, for ter the territorial redistribution across places. Um, 
And, and for that reason, and because just as it, it's created this need for territorial redistribution across places, I'd argue that there's a need for social movements to also engage across places. Yet if we look at left politics, we often see discussions of re-territorialization that focus either on jumping scales and creating some sort of supranational rules of the game and institutions, perhaps through the United Nations or other entities, I don't know. Or, on the other hand, which is more, pre this is, I think is more prevalent, the radical decentralization that creates semi-autonomous, localized spaces of alternative practice. But, but I think Jacques Ranciere has said it well. Proclaiming themselves simply to be administering the local consequences of global historical necessity, our governments take great care to banish the, de the democratic supplement through the invention of superstate institutions which are not states, which are not accountable to any people. They realize their imminent ends of their very practice, to depoliticize political matters, to reserve them for places that are not places, so the state and their experts can quietly agree among themselves. All right, that's, that's, that's a critique of the supranational uh, idea. What about the real localized places of alternative practice? I'd like to suggest that if we're here to think about redesigning uh, a post-neoliberal city, these all alternative spaces of, of micro-practice are another false utopia. Look, we all need to live, and so if folks feel that their greatest need is to express themselves and their individual freedoms, fine. Uh, if they want to do that in their own micro-communities, fine. I'm not, I didn't come all the way to Zagreb to stop anyone. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I'll admit, I mean, there is something to this politics of refusal, saying every so often, you know, I'd rather not to. I'd rather not continue to play the game by these rules. So I get it. I understand that. But, but my provocative claim to you today is that if we're, if we're engaging in an individual politics of refusal, and if we're doing this somehow in the name of a radical anti-neoliberal urban politics, we're fooling ourselves. Such pursuits are entirely consistent with elements of neoliberal urban governance. In fact, urban elites will tell you, you know, now that I see that, that, that it's all right with you, we'll continue to make the weighty decisions of social rule, and you can get on with your individual private life. We, can have, we have our experts anyway, and, and they'll just take it from here, and everything will be fine. I'd argue there's a danger that, that an individual politics of refusal can degenerate into a form of post-political retreat from democracy. The very same hatred of democracy that has been a feature of late neoliberal urban governance. I'm more interested in taking back the city as a political space, as a space of public encounter. This suggests that there's an urgent need for a new politics of place in light of, the, of uneven development under late neoliberalism and the violent, polarized, and undemocratic realities facing cities today. The global economic crisis offered new strategic opportunities for social forces and political alliances to, pro to promote market restraining and even market transcending regulatory strategies. But I, it didn't really happen. Um, so, and, and, and let's remember that even prior to the recent crisis, there, there had been plenty of organized opposition to neoliberal policies by workers' movements, by peasant movements, by urban social movements, and by various anti-globalization movements, and in some cases, even by official political parties. In the wake of the current crisis, though, there may be new openings, new breaking points for social movements and political organizations to pursue alternative agendas, while, the process, uh, while in the process continuing to disseminate critiques of neoliberal capitalism. But here, too, there's a danger that counter-neoliberal projects will, will remain disarticulated. That is, they'll remain largely confined to localized arenas with little relation to one another, uh, while still being embedded with the same geo-institutional context that, that are dominated by market disciplinary regulatory arrangements. Right? There's still a danger that they will stay in these sort of small scale, not connected up uh, across space. Um, and this suggests that moving toward post-neoliberal forms of urban governance will require alliance building within and across our cities in an effort to supersede the patterns of development that have been entrenched by neoliberalism. I submit to you that, if we're, that we'll never arrive in the post-neoliberal city if we travel alone. 
if we retreat into our own enclaves of alternative practice without reaching out to find common ground in the fractured, polarized metropolis and to build alliances within and between social movement actors that first challenge and that first challenge institutions and then make a play for those very same institutions um, of power including making a play for the nation state so in wrapping this up and concluding i'd like to return the question is neoliberalism dead and and our answer uh neil uh, neil jamie and i um is to paraphrase is Jürgen Habermas yes it's dead dead but dominant as Jamie Peck has written neoliberal neoliberalism's intellectual project may be dead but as a mode of, of crisis driven governance neoliberalism has entered its zombie phase that's right zombie neoliberalism dead from the neck up but but animated by technocratic forms of muscle memory deep instincts of self-preservation and prone to spasmodic bursts of social violence. Neoliberalism has ceased to, to offer any new ideas for resolving the troubles of our time, but the rule of markets as a form of social rule remains the dominant ethos of urban governance. And for this reason, life in the post-neoliberal post city re remains as elusive as ever. Thanks. I'll give floor to uh, Tomislav Tomasevic, uh, who will try to uh, contextualize uh, the talk that we've heard now um, in the context of uh, Zagreb and, and, and uh, Croatia, um, both, I guess, reflecting on uh, the process that uh, Right to the City has been going through and uh, broader political uh, issues. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Thank you. So, so if, if we take this theory that there is no one monolithic neoliberalism and that basically it, this kind of set of policies and uh, ideologies are kind of adjusted to the institutional uh, heritage of certain territory and space, that, that would then pose a question what would be then a distinctive neoli neoliberal organization in Zagreb or in Croatia or even if we can even talk about this kind of national jurisdictions and geographics uh, between the borders uh, so if the, neoliberal, the neoliberalism would actually fit even within these uh, national borders that's also maybe another question uh, but uh, what you what you basically explained kind of I think uh, and maybe uh, people here like, here we and we'll, we'll hear that in discussion kind of pretty much reminds on what's also happening in Zagreb and Croatia and I'm, I'm sure when you use this kind of mat matrix of different policies in different sectors of neoliberal urbanization, I can't, it, it kind of feels, uh, feels very uh, familiar and very similar to what is actually happening in Zagreb, which then poses this question, okay, maybe it's not, you know, it's not the mayor of Bandic who is actually uh, an evil guy and therefore he's doing it, but also it's also the structural framework in which he's also operating. Yeah. So then there's also a question of how much different can it be with a different mayor. But again, there's also not one neoliberalism, and there are distinctive features probably of the neoliberalism in Zagreb or in Croatia. So if you look at the, and here there are I think a lot of architects in the audience and uh, urbanists, and probably they would agree that there was also a very clear shift with the way of, of urban planning in Zagreb, uh, comparing to the uh, uh, self governing socialism that we had before in terms of that the city is now basically managed as a company almost. Mm. As a company on a market, on a market which is a national creation market, but also, as you said, an international market where cities compete one with each other. And basically also to, to draw one parallel with something which is happening in New York and other cities, uh, Zagreb Mayor Bandic uh, a few years ago said that those who cannot afford to live in Zagreb should move away. Because you want the city of Zagreb wants very successful people who are able to create an added value and therefore be in a winning team of the city of Zagreb who competes on the international market. And basically, this statement is very similar, almost to the word, to the to the famous statement of uh, Mayor, ex-mayor of New York, Bloomberg, who also said that you know people 
New York wants to attract a creative class of successful people who can afford to live, there, live here. Those who cannot afford should basically move on. Uh, and then also, uh, there's, uh, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of other policies that you, that you mentioned, uh, like entrepreneurial zones and uh, the inner city development, uh, uh, which is now uh, given to the private market, uh, this is also very familiar with the case of uh, of Tietnik uh, Ferg and Varsovska Street, where basically also there's a new kind of uh, approach in, in the city government, where it's not the citizens who are shaping the city, it's not even the city government who is shaping the city, it's the, the developers. So it's the private investors, it's the market who is in basically shaping uh, the city and the government here is here just to assist to the market and basically deregulate any kind of social planning which was pretty much uh, a heritage I think uh, before uh, before the 90s uh, but then also there are, there are some other examples which also uh, uh, look very similar so not just in a city center uh, regeneration and gentrification which is happening during actually the campaign for uh, for flower square for certain we had even uh, the daily newspapers who were uh, uh, publishing articles about crazy old women in the city center who don't want to sell their apartment and they live with eight cats and they're very rational because uh, they are here some new developers who want to buy their apartments, collapse, uh, destroy their, their buildings and then build some new, uh, new buildings with luxury apartments, garages and shopping malls. And, and, and branding here is also uh, the case. It's also the, that this uh, shopping mall in Svetoturg is not called shopping mall, it's called a lifestyle center. So it's much more than a shopping mall with a garage and luxurious apartments. Uh, but also the, then there are many other cases uh, in cities are like uh, the case of Ikea, where basically uh, it's an international furniture store. It's not something that will bring a lot of jobs, it's not an industry that we are attracting to City of Zagreb, yet the government is giving all enormous concessions in terms of agricultural land, which is then being urbanized in terms of moving the toll, uh, the toll road uh, system so, so the highway can be uh, open just for the, for, uh, and free of charge for the use of customers of IKEA uh, market store. And then uh, also, uh, in terms of more privatization, I mean, th this is very actual now with the, the holding, uh, the Zagrebashi holding, which is the multi-utility uh, public company, which is giving different communal services to citizens of Zagreb, which is now uh, being discussed to be privatized uh, in terms of different services, especially uh, waste collection service. And here is also not so hard to establish some links how this policy transfers actually appear right. and of course there are many other networks of how the ideology and the policy transfer come to cities like Zagreb and Croatia through different maybe external edu maybe education of elites uh, maybe uh, international financial institutions and policy programs etc but also uh, it's it's also interesting that even the bond rating agencies so the notorious free bond rating agencies like uh, like Fitch, uh, Standard & Poor and uh, Moody's I don't know how many people here in the audience know that, but Moody's is also doing a bond rating not just for Croatia. And then when you hear in media, you know, that we are junk, etc., this kind of news. Uh, they're actually doing also bond rating for City of Zagreb. And they're doing the bond rating for Zagreb Holding. <coughs> and, the, uh, and then when, uh, uh, when city government decided to, uh, to place uh, bonds of uh, holding on London market in 2007, for two billions of kunas, and actually spend that money not for uh, repairing the leaks in the water distribution system as they were supposed to, but for different real estate speculations. And now we have the debt, because of which actually uh, the Moody's in the bond rating report a few years ago said, and I, I, you know, I remind you, this is a small, rather small company which, with a few hundred employees in Manhattan, New York, that gave a bond rating report for City of Zagreb and said that basically what City of Zagreb should do to get a better bond rating because to repay the old debt we will have to probably issue some new bonds to get some new debt and basically their, uh, their uh, recommendation, policy recommendation was uh, a further privatization of communal services and also 
taking out the subsidies for public transport, etc. And then you can see a clear link how the public transport in the city of Zagreb is becoming more expensive and now actually is pretty much similar. The price of the tram ride in the city of Zagreb is similar to, to a ride of metro in New York. Mm -hmm. So, so you can see this very, very clear links of this kind of policy transfer. Of course, this is only the policy transfer on a, on a, on a paper. That doesn't mean uh, that policy just happens. That uh, the policies are just implemented. As you said, policies are the implementation of policies is a very uh, contested and negotiated process between different actors and different experiments. Sometimes fail, sometimes reinvented. So, so there's a there's a kind of a, a different mixture of experiments, uh, and we, we are not sure how this how how these trends will actually uh, finish. Uh, but also, uh, but also, I think there are some still some differences. Let's say if we look at the uh, the, the the cities in the United States, and, and maybe here, uh, and we it's hard to say how long will the Croatian cities be different mm -hmm. to some of the U.S. cities, but definitely. They are these institutional frameworks which are different, which make neoliberalization a little bit different here than maybe in the U.S. for the last 30 years. One of these, uh, 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 one of these institutional arrangements, which is a bit different in my opinion, which is quite crucial, is the tax system, which then, uh, because in Croatia, as you know, we don't have real estate tax, which is then not just uh, which is used for in in U.S. for different local services, including schools. So the, the price of the real estate, so basically the neighborhood where you live the, uh, determines the price of your real estate. Yep. The price of your real estate determines the taxes, the real estate taxes you pay for the municipal budget. And that municipal budget is then, the revenues are given to the even school system. Therefore, I mean, if you live in a poor neighborhood, you will probably go to a, a poor school, which then just leads to repro repro kind of reproduction of the class system, etc. So that's something where still in Croatia we don't have, but as you already said, we have a, a welfare state under attack. We have a centralized uh, financing of the education system, but that maybe will not be the case in 10, 15 years. Uh, we have some talks about real estate uh, introductions. And for some on the left, this might be uh, a welcome thing mm -hmm. because it will, might lead to some kind of redistribution. But still, if these real estate taxes are actually used to subsidize the, the income tax, which is the main uh, tax in Croatia, that would lead uh, to a different also uh, way how the urban development actually feels. Because the volatility of, uh, of real estate prices in the urban markets in Croatia is is uh, let's say more stable than mm -hmm. the volatility yeah. in the U.S., where basically one neighborhood can just go bust. I mean, we don't have that kind of uh, uh, that that huge market volatility in house prices yet, mm -hmm. and it's hard to say it, it might actually happen that these trends will continue, and then the neoliberalization in Croatia and Zagreb will might actually look a lot like in the U.S. Uh, and also, uh, in terms of uh, the, the PPPs, public-private partnerships, uh, there's a case, uh, there's a few people from Pula here in the audience. We don't have so many of public-private partnerships, again, yet. In terms, of, in terms of planning the city, like in the US cities where basically there's a public-private partnership to plan the whole area of the city, not just a few blocks. But again, there are some worrying trends in Croatia, like in Pula, where uh, uh, in the case of Mozil you have uh, one fourth or one fifth of the surface of the whole Pula being given to concession to a private investor for more than 50 years to actually plan this area of the city uh, as it feels fits. Uh, and also in, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, different uh, situation I'll just end with, uh, with your note on the tactics of the resistance. Yeah where you said uh, that uh, it's, first of all, that's impo it, important to understand uh, the, the neoliberalism and how it functions and, it's, and that it's actually variegated across the space, across the scales, but also in terms of the political uh, uh, opposition towards the, this process, uh, you said it's, uh, it's hard to actually win this battle by creating a micro zones or enclaves, yeah. as you said, of autonomous alternative struggles and and here uh, I would agree in, 
I mean, as somebody who was involved in different uh, social movements on urban level, I would agree that it's important uh, to kind of uh, maintain an open field opposition, an open open field. So let's say to tackle these policies in an open field, in the public arena, in the political arena, in the physical space as well. So even occupying sometimes physical space, like was done uh, in Occupy Wall Street, but also was done in Vashuska Street, which was also occupied for uh, more than one month uh, during the campaign. And then have some of these uh, enclaves of alternative uh, practice as some kind of uh, experimentation field, but not to think that this is enough and that we can actually create our perfect world in a small micro space by, ju by just then ignoring what is happening on higher scales. Thanks. So we might open now the floor for any uh, questions and comments regarding what you heard. So do you agree with this? <laughs> I sound like they do. I think we're done. <laughs> or, I don't know, on either on theoretical level that there is no one single neoliberalism in practice, but that there are different varieties of neoliberalisms, mm -hmm. or do you agree with these theoretical notions or not? I have one question for, yeah. uh, for Nick. When you were mentioning capitalism and <coughs> neoliberalism, mm -hmm. you never said in, in a sense, oh, uh, that is the same. neoliberalization. You never says neoliberal capitalism. You used, I think, twice contemporary capitalism and once late capitalism. Yeah. Like, how do you relate uh, the process of neoliberalization with the history of, yeah. of capitalism? Because it's not somehow seems that this neoliberalization is some kind of uh, governmental method or practice that yeah. is uh, distanced from the from the logic of the capital accumulation. So you can you just yeah. I, I mean, the idea is that I mean certainly. Capitalism predated neoliberalism, but the other, I guess maybe I was using a bunch of different uh, ways to say this. Um, in the current contemporary period, uh, neoliberalism has been sort of the operating system for this form of capitalism, and that it is dri it is driven it is a neoliberal logic upon which much of capitalism has been based. And I think that's what we've been trying to dis disentangle and what that has been for cities. But it's they've become it has become the the ideology of this current version of capitalism that we have. Yes? Just another question. Yeah. <coughs> you mentioned that uh, there is a danger of um, uh, being uh, not so strong those particular uh, answers to neoliberalism. So do you have any suggestion to, to, to fight that, let's say, morphing octopusy that that's, uh, uh, changes for every uh, instant and every situation that it encounters? You know, it... it uh, sorry, especially for, for, for a small uh, area like Croatia, is not to mention Zagreb or... Yeah. I, I hope this answer... I, w I was thinking of um, something that Tomislav was saying about the transfers. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I think this may fit as well. In the United States, we have a Right to the City Alliance as well. And the Right to the City Alliance in the United States was formed as a national alliance. And the reason for this was that they, what they were realizing is, whether it was Miami or Los Angeles or New York City, they were often encountering the very same developers, the very same banks, the very same policy advisors that were bringing these packages and remaking cities. Um, and so what they realized was that, so you wound up with all these local struggles popping up. Uh, and each one had to start all over again. So that suddenly, here come these, this group of developers, banks, and advisors to Miami. And Miami has to try to figure out what is it that they're doing, how do they do their politics, and so on. So in the Right to the City Alliance within the United States, the idea is to share that information. And then to have national targets. That if they, if, if they want to try to change the debate, um, they, they, they try to do it in m many places at once. 
we're still talking about small organizations. We're still talking about underfunded organizations. We're still talking about organizations that struggle for media attention and to get the attention of policymakers. But by uniting these, they've done some major actions against banks in certain cities that have gotten a lot of attention in Boston and other places. And in their local fights, they're, they're sharing tactics and sharing their understanding of what those developers and others are doing so that they can be one step ahead of them rather than one step behind. So I, I think that, you know, just to make it a little more concrete again, I mean, that's one of the ways in which these ideas, I think, uh, are, are evolving in resistance practices and, and in other things. I don't know if I'm answering your question completely, but... Um, yeah, if I may, add, at least yeah. on this opposition level, right. maybe not uh, what is the alternative level, but at least on right. this opposition level, uh, it's pretty much a similar tactic that we were using as well in terms of focusing on one location with a different kind of society forces right. and social movements, and then through one example try to show all the contradictions and kind of unite the uh, uh, opposition and then get some media attention, public attention, yeah. and then try to change at least these forces. And that was here uh, in Tepetar uh, before, and then it moved uh, to Dubrovnik uh, with, with this huge golf course which was being developed. Uh, and now it's also in Pula uh, regarding this uh, Mozil. So it's pretty much the tactics uh, are being kind of exchanged and shared. And also, but also the case is that it's not just Croatia, it's not just Zagreb. So the th the, also the sharing of the theory and exchanging the theory behind the processes and also exchanging the examples of how these processes actually manifest in different countries is also what is needed yeah. internationally yeah. to actually uh, kind of exchange. And then also in terms of tactics levels, because if, if, you know, if uh, Zagreb is uh, one city on the international market, or Croatia is one country in the international market, these kind of uh, uh, alliances need to be also cross-national. And yeah. here basically we can see that we play the same game within the region. We just discussed this before, where you have the now, now the case of uh, Serbia, for example, uh, where you have the case of Belgrade, where they say, you know, if we don't get this capital, then the, the Zagreb will. Or if we don't get these factories of Italian cars, then Croatia will. And, and let's now, in Serbia, what's actually happening, let's change the, the law on labor, so we actually decrease even more the worker standards because we want to bring the capital and if we don't do it, then Croatia will. And if they actually succeed in this, then actually the next step will be for Croatia. Okay, now we have to go even further down with our labor law. So that is the game actually that we are playing. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's one big global game where you have to share the theory, uh, yeah. where you have to share the experience in tactics and campaigns, where you have to be in solidarity with other uh, struggles all around the world. But then in the same time, what is also needed is this uh, th theoretical uh, kind of work on the alternative solutions, but also the experimentation. And therefore, I think even this micro level, micro scale, let's make our perfect world in a small community, uh, experiments are useful at least because they can show you know some some other possible alternative worlds but if this is going to be enough of course it will not be but i think this this example of the Serbian labor standards is a perfect example of the problem uh, because it, it's something that's happening over there somewhere else, yet you could easily see how it, it'll enter your own political debate and be happening to you. And so politically, there's it, beyond, I don't know what you do politically with that, but it's it, it suggests that the problems will not be necessarily of your making, but there will be the ones you'll be dealing with soon. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Okay, I have one. Oh no. Um, <laughs> this is what I was worried about. <laughs> um, uh, the framing of uh, uh, the notion of uh, neoliberalism is uh, very much about institutions and uh, social governance. So it's kind of uh, uh, the perspective of um, it's, it's the ruling perspective. How how do you uh, shape the society? But uh, in a way, uh, I think that much of the neoliberal governance has to do with the fact that um, uh, capitalism uh, 
and, and uh, the relation of capitalism and free markets fragments the, the agency. So basically, what you need to do as, as, a, a, govern, as a government, you need to create conditions that attract uh, capital uh, so that it can count on, on, on certain returns on investment, on, on profit. But you do not control the process of uh, accumulation. And um, uh, that is kind of uh, the dynamic there. But unless you are uh, able to uh, relate to uh, relate that to the relation between uh, capital and labor, I think that you you lose uh, and, and uh, frame it rather within uh, the notion of markets. You lose uh, an antagonistic. Uh, moment there that uh, relates to uh, uh, the power between uh, the economic forces and uh, those who feel the pressure. But rather, you you frame it just as a policy debate. So yeah, that, that's my. Um, yeah, I mean that's a fair that's a, a fair critique. I think I think we we've, we've focused at a certain level without getting into all all of the dimensions. I think what what I've tried to argue here is that all right, Croatia and Zagreb, complex place has a complex history, but every place has a complex history, and and so what. What neoliberalism does is, and this is where our focus has been, it, our focus has been on how neoliberalism works and acts on institutions and remakes them. Um, and, and how it, it acts on institutions and remake, uh, acts on institutions and remakes them, acts on markets and remakes them, acts on states and remakes them, and acts on public space and remakes it. And so we, we can take um, different uh, strategies of neoliberalism, deregulation, privatization, the, the lure of mega projects, and so on. Um, and what we, what we see is that the state employs those strategies. Um, and while on the one hand it retains the power, or, the, or retains the authority, so the state employs these strategies, retains the authority of the state, but at the same time, um, is involved in a massive transfer of power into private hands. And it's not just a massive transfer of power in the abstract sense, it's a massive transfer of power that leaves, leads to a massive transfer of wealth. And I think you see this in your central city development, right? You had, as I've been told, rule, the, the, st the state retains the authority, it wrote the rules, it had the laws. It changed the rules and changed the laws, which led to a massive transfer of power into private hands and an incredible transfer of wealth. And so we, what's, what's important to us is that these generic strategies of deregulation or privatization uh, or you know, pursuit of mega projects, they, they lead to certain other events. They lead to speculation. They lead to gentrification. They lead to displacement. And what that looks like in Zagreb or Chicago is going to be different um, because it's going to depend on the nature of housing markets in those places. It's going to depend on the, nat the nature of social support in those places. And I think, to your point, it's going to, it's going to depend on the, na the nature of other social relations, capital labor relations, and other, other forces uh, that exist there, and the ability and the strength of those other forces to contest that process. You had a big battle of contestation. And I agree, when you're small and you're up against a big thing, you have to make certain projects emblematic of the struggle. You have to shine a spotlight on certain projects. Um, and and the, the stronger that you are, the, the more you'll slow or change those. It sounds like in this one, despite a, a good fight, um, the project eventually went ahead basically as planned. But you learn from that example. And the next time, hopefully you're more prepared and you can now point to this and say, did it deliver the promises that it was sold on? Usually they don't. And so I think this is an ongoing struggle that's going to involve other people, but you learn from those and you learn from the space, the, the local specificities of your own condition. Yes. I have a question about the trajectories for American debt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, it's like this way, now. Right? Uh, yes. Uh, Conditionally so, speaking. So right. the United in Seattle, where a socialist politician entered in municipal council, and I think another example is uh, Minneapolis, mm. and on the uh, higher level, in the state level, 
uh, pretty much progressive policies of a senator else before. So how do you cover these uh, let's faces on, on American left if we if, if we can call it a left or alternative politics? I, you know, I think in the U.S. it's never been quite as clear cut. We've always had you know, maverick politicians, both on the right and on the left, that are able to, to work their way into uh, sometimes very high levels of office. But I think as you've seen, uh, with our, you know, there was a lot, we often have a lot of hope for these. We had a hope for a president from Chicago as well, uh, that things are going to be radically different. But I think what we've seen is it's very been very difficult uh, to make those changes. I think it's hard for it, a set of independent politicians uh, in a city to, to make big changes, but it, these are important small steps, I think, that we have to celebrate. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a complex place, as you know, and uh, like every place, as I said, that, um, that has a lot of back and forth, but that phenomenon isn't new. To me, the bigger one, uh, which has had a much more profound impact at every level of government, has been on the right. Right has been the Tea Party and uh, and and a reactionary right that has closer connections with the media that has a simple and seductive message uh, and has been incredibly problematic not just for progressive forces but for the right as well. It has pushed the right hard into, into directions of cultural politics and other bizarreness, um, de denial of climate change and everything else uh, you can think of. It has pushed them in a, in a direction that has really been a disruptive force in U.S. politics. US poli the mainstream U.S. politics depends on some sort of balance. The balance has, has shifted so badly that uh, it has pushed the, the right wing further right and it's pushed Obama and others to the right as well. That to me is the bigger story of U.S. politics rather than the, the few small achievements, though they must be celebrated, that have occurred on the progressive left. And what are your expectations of the new mayor of New York? It's hard to know, you know. Uh, the 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 uh, I sometimes like to watch the conservative television programs, and they were going crazy with this guy being elected. I mean, uh, uh, really upset about it. But then everyone I know in New York says it's not going to be any big deal. So I don't, you know, who can you trust these days? Tell me, who can you trust? <laughs> Okay, is there more questions, or this is going to be our end call? <laughs> it seems you are cheering for the end call. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, keeping you trust in, in the zo zombie land. Uh, that's a fun word. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sam. Um, and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, our next talk in the series will be on June 17th, so it's five months from now. <laughs> I come in the middle of winter and the next one's in June? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's no many issues to talk about. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see who survives by the way. If zombies eat up your wings. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.